This is your girl, Yannick Taylor, a.k.a. Priestess, hostess of Conversations with the Priestess. Here's a preview of what you may hear on Conversations with the Priestess. We weren't meant for monogamy, let's be honest. Like, we have needs, let's be real. And communicating that, what you want, what you don't want, what sets up... Now, this drink is brown, because I learned something. Since I'm older, I can't do brown liquor anymore. Also, I noticed since I started on hormone replacement there, HRT, in 2015, me and certain liquors don't mix, don't mix well. I don't know whether... And I recognize that a lot of men love to be dominated by women. And that's because men are seen as these leaders, as this big alpha male dominant thing, dominant being. And because they're put on this pedestal of being leaders, sometimes they want to be submissive. Back when I cosplayed a butch queen in South Carolina around 2011, I was on Craigslist. This is when Craigslist was bumping and before they had gotten rid of the personal section. I hope you enjoyed that preview. Join me on Wednesdays at 9 p.m. for Priestess After Dark. Full video versions of the podcast can be found on patreon.com forward slash CWT Priestess. And join me on Fridays at noon for our regular Friday post. Live, love, and be free. Smooches. Available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, anywhere you download and stream podcasts. Hey everybody, it's Justin. I am back with another episode of Mysterious Circumstances Podcast. Uh, Tonight, we got one hell of a mystery here for you. We're going to be talking about the very short life and very mysterious death of Bobby Fuller, who was the lead singer and guitarist of the Bobby Fuller Four in the mid-1960s. On July 18th, 1966, Bobby's body was found. Uh, slumped over in the front seat of his mom's Oldsmobile after he had borrowed it the night before. His body was totally doused with gasoline, and the doors were shut, windows rolled up. He was already in an advanced stage of rigor mortis, which means he was already dead for a few hours. And the actual autopsy from the uh, L.A. Coroner, or L.A. County Coroner's Office, they actually had accidental and suicide boxes checked on the death certificate with question marks beside them. Now, we're going to get into why these question marks were checked. We're going to talk about who was there on the scene, witnesses, and theories into what happened to Bobby Fuller. So, uh, buckle your seatbelts because this one's going to get really interesting. And I'm pretty sure you're going to walk away from this episode with more questions than answers. Because I've been researching this for about three weeks, and I have so many different accounts of what happened and what Bobby was like the last couple weeks of his life. It's it's never ending. It really is. There's there's a lot of questions going on here. So anyway, let's get a little bit to Bobby. He was uh he's born on October twenty second, nineteen forty two, in Baytown, Texas. When he was a little younger, his his family moved to uh, Salt Lake City, Utah. Uh, And they actually moved back to El Paso in 1956. Now, right around in 56 was when Buddy Holly and Eddie Cochran were were just jamming. I mean, you know, Buddy Holly was was the king of rock and roll. I mean, Elvis had just started too, but Buddy Holly was king of Texas right about now. So Bobby pretty much idolized this guy and used his sound to kind of form his own sound. Now, if you listen to a lot of Bobby Fuller's music, which a lot of his more well-known songs were uh, I Fought the Law and The Law Won, which actually wasn't his song. It was a cover of uh, a Crickets song that the Crickets did after Buddy Holly died. But Bobby Fuller pretty much owns it, man. I mean, it's it's an awesome song. But he also had a couple other hits. Uh, Letter Dance was one of them, which is a pretty good tune. And uh, Never to Be Forgotten is another one. Now, when they returned to El Paso in 56, Bobby was roughly 14, 15 years old, and he was, he was already into 
playing guitar by then. Uh, he had, he built his own recording studio in, in his backyard, which was complete with an echo chamber and everything. Uh, he was really into producing his own sounds, and he liked the raw sound. He practiced constantly, but he was not into the overproducing of anything, really. So he was really adamant about recording his own music the way he wanted to. In uh, 61, he went through Yucca Records in New Mexico, and they actually recorded and released a couple of his singles, which which started getting airplay in El Paso. He actually opened up his own all-ages nightclub type deal where he was trying to get his music out there, and he made himself the house band. So he's definitely an entrepreneur as well. Uh, he's a very, very intelligent guy from everything I've read from everybody that knew him. Bobby Fuller was an extremely intelligent guy. The rest of the band included his little brother Randy, who played bass, and he, they Jim Reese played guitar, and then they had a couple different drummers uh, in and out. Uh, Dwayne Kiriko and uh, Dalton Powell pretty much alternated. They kind of got tired of the El Paso scene. It was kind of getting played out. Uh, so in 64, Bobby and uh, Randy go to to Delphi Records in L.A. Bob Keane, who owned Delphi Records, and also their, their sister record companies, which were uh, Bronco Records, Mustang Records, and uh, Donna Records, which Donna Records was actually named after a song that Richie Valens did. Because Bob Keane was actually the one who discovered Richie Valens when he was about 16 years old. If you ever seen the movie La Bamba, he's played in that movie. So anyway, in 64, they they get out there and Bob Keane, he listens to their stuff. And he's pretty much saying, well, you know, I'd like to hear a little bit more. Why don't you guys brush up on your stuff? You know, I don't want to hear any, any cover songs. I want to hear originals. So they go back to uh, El Paso and work on some material. And about a year later, they go back out to L.A. Right around late 64, 65, they go back to L.A. And Bob Keane signs them to Mustang Records. And Bob Keane, he was more of a surf music kind of guy. You know, Dick Dale and, you know, that the surf rock, you know, Dick Dale, freaking Beach Boys, stuff like that. It was the West Coast. It's what was happening. Um, now, in 64, 65, this is when the British invasion is going on. So, the 50 style rock that they played might not have suited Bob Keane very well. So, when they first start getting into the studios, Bob Keane's doing a lot of gimmicky stuff. He's overdubbing a lot of their tracks. He actually gets Barry White. Yes, the Barry White who was actually an artist on his Bronco label, because Bronco was Bronco Records was for R&B artists, um, to play drums for him. So they start getting a lot of, lot of airplay, okay? They start coming up, and this is right around the time when the psychedelic factor of, of L.A. is in full effect, okay? This is like 65, early 66. They hit the ground running they, when they released uh, I Fought the Law. It, it was an awesome song for the time. It's still an awesome song. It really is. So Bob Keane puts them on just this huge, grueling tour. All right, they're touring nonstop, and I hate I hate using the word gimmicky again, but but Bob Keane is just he's I'm trying to think of the right way to say it. He's just really pushing them in the wrong direction. He's overproducing their albums. This is not what Bobby wants. Bobby is more of a Tex-Mex, Buddy Holly rocker, just born and, and bred on, on that Texas rock and roll. So there's a little bit of friction there, okay, within the group. Uh, right around this time, Bobby starts experimenting with LSD. And at the time, LSD is actually still legal. Um, it's actually legal until about October 6th of 1966. Um, Bobby wasn't a big drinker, but he did experiment with LSD a little bit. And from all accounts that I've read from his brother and bandmates and friends, um, he really didn't take it to the extreme, but he he did like experimenting a little bit, which, you know, in, in, in 
the rock and roll era of the mid sixties. Who the hell didn't? <laughs> you know, who the hell didn't? So right around uh, early July, they're just wrapping up a tour, and I've heard two different accounts of this concert in San Francisco that they played the last concert. I saw one account where they actually played the concert, and it was a total bust. It was, you know, this was actually from somebody who was supposedly there. She said that the the band just, just hated being there. They were playing freaking teenage dances. Uh, the tour, Randy Fuller, his younger brother and bass player, uh, said that they were playing, you know, sold-out shows in... In LA at places like PJ's nightclub, which is going to come in, it's going to play a factor here in a lot of the theories. Uh, PJ's nightclub in LA was the place where a lot of celebrities went. They actually had a show, uh, celebrity night at PJ's and they'd release live records and have a bunch of celebrities there. But then on the other side of the spectrum, they were also playing total dives, teen dance type crap concerts. Okay. Uh, Bob Keen was pretty much just pushing them to the, to the max limit, just over scheduling them, uh, trying to overproduce their records to get the sound that he wanted that he thought listeners would, would rather enjoy other than what Bobby thought was good for the band. Now, this is going to lead up to right around that time, Bobby and the rest of the band are getting their, the, you know, tensions are high. Bobby, actually stated that he wants to go solo at about this time. Now, the band knows it. Bob Keen knows this. And I'm going to go ahead and assume Bob Keen's silent investors also know this. Now, Bob Keen's silent investors are also going to play a huge part in this in this story when it comes to theories as well. Uh, some of Bob Keen's silent investors included a couple owners of PJ's Nightclub, which were Eddie Nash and uh, Dominic Lucci. Now, Eddie Nash, for those of you who might not know who this is, he was actually cleared of four homicides in the 1970s that were uh, dubbed the Wonderland Murders. Now, if any of you have ever seen the movie Boogie Nights with Mark Wahlberg, um, he plays John Holmes, which was the 1970s porn star, and that's the, the quadruple murder that is depicted in that movie. Now, Eddie Nash was directly related to that. He actually got cleared of the murders. Uh, Dominic Lucci was supposedly pretty connected to the mafia on the East Coast. Um, his girlfriend and uh, waitress at PJ's was a lady named Melody. All right, Melody is also going to play a factor. Uh, Melody is said to have possibly been a part-time prostitute. Uh, that's neat, not really confirmed. One story that I did read is that Dominic, since he was a silent partner with Bob Keen, and they knew that they were having problems with Bobby possibly wanting to leave, was supposed to befriend him and get close enough to him to where she could basically give Dominic the inside track on what he's doing, where he's going, how he's feeling, you know, what he's wanting to do, and all that stuff like that. Uh, Eddie Nash, going back to Eddie Nash too, um, he actually got out of numerous convictions besides the, uh, four homicides in the seventies. He got out of numerous convictions, including arson, drug trafficking, and murder. And from all accounts, I can, from what I can tell, uh, Eddie Nash is actually still alive. Uh, there's a lot of information out there on Eddie Nash is actually quite interesting, including the Wonderland murders. So if you if you get the bug, you can definitely look him up and all that good stuff. But anyway, those are some silent investors that were with Bob Keen, kind of giving him some money, blah, blah, blah. Some other major players in the game here were a guy named Larry Nunes, who was uh, another partner of Bob Keen. I don't know too much on him, but he was... He was definitely a silent partner and supposedly had taken out a life insurance policy. Bob Keane says that he doesn't know anything about it, but apparently Larry Nunes took out a life insurance policy of anywhere between 800000 and $1 million on Bobby Fuller about 
right around a month before he died. Now, that's not really confirmed, but pretty much everything that I've read says that there was a life insurance policy taken out on Bobby Fuller and that they're not exactly sure who the benefactor was, but it sure wasn't anybody in his family or friends. Uh, Bob Keane says he doesn't know anything about it. From all accounts that I've read, again, Bob Keane was pretty much a snake, and there's all kinds of pay scams going on in the 60s in L.A. in the music industry, and there's a lot of a lot of reports of the mob being involved in the music industry in the 60s, so take that with a grain of salt. So we're going to get up to where the night before Bobby Fuller, or the day before Bobby Fuller is found, they say Bobby was a little bit depressed during the last weeks of his life, but he never really appeared to be suicidal. Most of the recording sessions for the band's third and final album ended up turning into shouting matches because Bobby was fed up with the whole the whole scene with Bob Keen. Um, he was distancing himself from his bandmates, and when he was at his apartment, he would usually be sitting in his bedroom listening to songs on his headphones but i've also read other accounts that he was in great spirits because he was planning on going solo and was actually really looking forward to doing his own thing so we got a little bit of contradiction there so take it as you will because there's going to be a lot of theories here coming up and you guys out there listening are going to have to probably try your best to not really solve it but form your own theories so I've, I've read both accounts that he was in great spirits. I've also heard accounts that he was a little bit distant, kind of depressed, but not to the point where he was suicidal. The guy had a lot to live. He had a top 10 hit. I thought The Law was a top 10 hit. It hit the Billboard top 10 probably, I think it was four months before he was found dead. So this guy was on the freaking rise, okay? Even though that genre of music was dying, Bobby Fuller was actually talented enough. He probably could have adapted to the new sounds and been just fine so he had a lot to live for he's actually planning on buying bandmate jim reese's jaguar the following monday off of him uh, because jim had recently gotten a draft for vietnam in the mail and had to report to duty in two weeks so he was actually going to be leaving the band but anyway on the last night of his life bobby a friend of his named rick stone who worked for the band and Bobby's mom, Lorraine, who had come down from Washington State to uh, see the boys and hang out, uh, they were actually on vacation for a couple weeks after playing that long, grueling tour, so they were kind of enjoying the relaxation mode. He was lounging around his apartment, in bathrobe, pajamas. Like I said, Rick Stone, a friend of his, was there. Uh, r- right around 10 o'clock at night, three girls from Opa- El Paso had stopped by to see Bobby. And there were actually a couple other of his friends in town that day and that night. It was uh, Ty Grimes and Mike Cicerello, who were fellow musicians from El Paso, who came up to see Bobby. Bobby, since he was thinking about going solo, it's speculated that he had actually called them to come up to talk about maybe doing, you know, a different band set up or jamming. It's it's hard telling, but they were in town to see see Bobby and, and Randy. So the girls from El Paso stopped by to see Bobby, and they chatted around and drank beer until midnight. Bobby called uh, Melody, a girl who worked at the at PJ's, and talked to her for a moment. Now there's also a report that Bobby called his quote unquote girlfriend, a girl named Nancy Norton, uh, and talked to her. She was a stewardess. Uh, who was based in New York, who uh, or Bobby was planning on getting to move to L.A. to get based there, you know, so they could be together. That that was one thing that I read out of like the 10 million things on the Internet. So I don't know how, how far that'll go. Now, here's where everything gets interesting. Shortly after 1 a.m., uh, Bobby received a phone call and abruptly left the apartment. He was still wearing his bathrobe. In pajamas, uh, Lorraine, his mom, and his friend Rick had already gone to bed. Um, it wasn't unusual for Bobby to stay up all night. They were on the road a lot, and you know, by four or five in the morning, they're probably eating dinner after closing a show. So they were up pretty late. When he left, the building manager of Sycamore Apartments, where he lived, 
uh, which is actually, I think, a block or two away from Groman Chinese Theater, which obviously is the, the Walk of Fame there in Hollywood. The building manager, whose name was Lloyd Essinger, confirmed that Bobby stopped by and drank beer until about 3 a.m. Now, that would make Essinger the last person to see Fuller that night. So, after he left there, supposedly Bobby got, in, got into his mother's Oldsmobile and drove away. So we get to the morning of July 18th, 1966, and Lorraine wakes up and notices that the Oldsmobile is still gone. The band had a recording session scheduled for 8.30 that morning at Delphi, so all the musicians gathered there um, at Delphi, waiting for Bobby to arrive. When Bob Keen got there, he, he asked where Bobby was, and nobody really knew where he was. And at about 2.30 p.m., they, they all gave up and, uh, and went home. Uh, at that point, at 2.30 p.m., Lorraine had still not heard from Bobby. Okay, so the, the band members are kind of, they're running around town, running some errands or whatnot. They're starting to get a little bit concerned about Bobby. Not knowing where he is. Dalton Powell, the drummer, and Jim Reese, the guitar player, actually had an apartment just a few few blocks away from, from Bobby's apartment. So Ty Grimes and Mike Cicerelli uh, show up at their apartment, you know, wanting to see Bobby. And at this point, it was a little bit before 5 p.m. They arrived at Sycamore Apartments. Both Dalton and Jim noticed when they pulled up that Bobby's car was not there, which Bobby's car was the Oldsmobile that his mother was driving. It was not there. It, he used to park it in a vacant lot uh, pretty much right beside the uh, the apartments. So they rang the do doorbell and got no answer. Uh, and Ty Grimes later would actually state that while they waited, he thought he saw a car pull into the lot. That is totally unconfirmed, but that's what he would later state. As they turn to leave, Lorraine Fuller come running towards them in a panic, and she had actually gone. She had been pretty much pacing back and forth, looking out the windows, looking to see, you know, if the car had come back pretty much all freaking day. She's calling around, looking everywhere. I mean, that's her son. You know, who who wouldn't? She She was in a state of panic. And she had actually gone down the back stairs to check the mail as Ty Grimes and uh, Mike Cicerelli are going up the front stairs. So they pretty much missed each other. And that's why Lorraine Fuller uh, did not answer the door when they rang the doorbell. So as, as they turn to leave, here comes Lorraine and she's in a total panic. And uh, while she was checking, checking the mail, she found Bobby's Oldsmobile in the parking lot. She opened up the driver's side door. And lying on the front seat of the car was was Bobby Fuller. The details of what what accounts next are are mixed. Okay, she thought he was actually sleeping in the car, and she she realized that she had probably only missed the car pulling up by a few moments. Uh, seeing as how she was checking adamantly out the window, going outside looking for the car. So she actually did not really see anything. She said that when she went down, she said the keys were in the ignition and his hand was, hands were on the keys as if he had tried to start the car. That's the only account that we have of the keys actually being in the ignition and his hands being on the keys. Now the rest of the witnesses on the scene are Lorraine Fuller, Ty Grimes, Mike Cicerelli, Dalton Powell, Jim Reese. All of them were on the scene. Now, they all agree that when they got to the car, the doors were shut, the windows were rolled up all the way. Uh, when they open up the door, the, the smell of gasoline fumes is just overpowering, okay? Bobby's lying on the front seat of the car, with his right hand, uh, his right index finger is actually bent back so far that it's broken. The eyewitnesses, which are Ty, Mike, Dalton, and Jim, and Lorraine, all agreed that Bobby had dried blood around his mouth and on his shirt. His bathrobe was missing. He had left in his bathrobe, and his, he was not wearing it at the time, nor was it found anywhere around the scene. So, you know, that begs the question, you know, when the hell did he take his bathrobe off? You know, supposedly he had left, you know, Essinger's apartment, the building manager, at right around 3, 3 a.m. 
Um, we're going to get into that theory too. But anyway, the other witnesses actually said that they did not see any keys in the ignition, nor were any keys found on Bobby at the time. One of his hands was wrapped around the hose of a gas can, which was on the passenger side floorboard. How, when you're halfway sitting in the passenger seat, can your left hand be around the hose, you know, with your right index finger broken? Uh, supposedly his hands were on the keys. This is where everything starts getting really, really confusing, okay? So, when the they call the police, okay, Lorraine... First, first uh, Lorraine calls Randy, which is Bobby's brother, calls him. He gets there. Uh, Bob Keane actually gets a phone call as well and shows up on the scene. Um, and as he's showing up on the scene, uh, I'm going to put this statement in quotes because uh, nobody else actually saw this happen that was there. Only Bob Keane says he saw a plainclothes officer take a gas can out of the car and throw it away in a dumpster and he asked the cop he said hey man what are you doing why are you throwing that away you know this this could possibly be evidence the cop looked at him and said and i quote uh, it's just another rock and roll suicide end quote so bobby's entire body is doused with gasoline he has dried blood around his mouth and on his clothes. His right index finger is broken, is bent backward to the point it's broken. There's a gas can in the front seat of the car that is one third full. Uh, actually, the LA County Coroner's report states that deceased was found laying face down in the car, gas can one third full with cover open, windows rolled up and doors shut. Doors were not locked, keys not in the ignition. The The best part about it was that it is actually ruled a suicide and an accidental death. Both boxes were checked on the death certificate with question marks behind them. Now, the 1st Division Hollywood Police also stated that there was a box of matches lying beside the body. Nobody else saw those with a total botched invest investigation as this is. It wouldn't surprise me that that was just added in there. Uh, we're not 100% sure. So they're looking at the body and they notice that there's a bunch of bruises on Randy's, or on Randy, uh, a bunch of bruises on Bobby's side and on his arm as if he had been beaten up. Okay, now the guy who did the autopsy, uh, I can't re really remember his name, he actually said that those are from Patechial hemorrhages, which is caused from gasoline vapors in an enclosed area with heat, all right? Now, these are a real thing, and if you look at pictures on the internet, they actually do look like really, really bad bruises, but that begs the question, uh, if that car was only there for a small amount of time, uh, you, your average temperature in LA in July is right around 80, 85 degrees. Now, if somebody dropping off the car, it couldn't have been there for that long, let alone driving down the road in a car with a dead guy beside you, doused in gasoline, or maybe he hadn't been doused in gasoline by then, we're not sure, it couldn't have happened that fast. Now, it's also a fun fact that Bobby's body was actually in an advanced stage of rigor mortis, which means that he had actually been dead for right around at least three hours how a dead guy drives his own car there i'll have no idea and decides to dump gas on himself you know and then light himself on fire is just beyond me i did read somewhere else that there was actually a uh gas soaked rag stuffed in his mouth um i only read one of one account of that so i'm not sure really if it was true now, another fact is that the gas can that was actually with the Oldsmobile was in the trunk of the car, okay? The gas can that was found in the front on the front floorboard beside Bobby's body was not the gas can that was with the car at the time. So, that begs another question, where did that come from? The LAPD does not dust for any fingerprints. They do not impound the car for searching for any more evidence they just decide that it's a suicide with all these 
questions surrounding it and pretty much just close the books. The family is obviously not very happy about this. And a couple other facts remain. Bobby, they didn't say Bobby drank the gasoline. They actually, when they did the autopsy, his stomach was not empty. And most doctors will agree, uh, if you try to swallow, if you try to kill yourself by drinking gasoline, uh, your body will force it out before you can really die. You'll throw it up, you'll have diarrhea, you'll be in so much pain that you probably couldn't drink anymore. But they said that it actually takes a lot to die and your body will actually push most of it out before you can kill yourself by it. Now the fumes on the other hand, they will kill you and they will kill you in a short amount of time. But they said Bobby's bully or body was lying ac across the, the car seat. So if he would have inhaled the gasoline, his body would have been contorted due to convulsions brought on by the gasoline. So he couldn't have really inhaled that gasoline. I granted he was in, in an enclosed vehicle in an intense amount of heat for who knows how long. Couldn't have been that long uh, because of the fact that the car appeared within a matter of moments from Lorraine Fuller checking the window and then checking for the mail. So while they're doing the autopsy, they actually stated that when they opened up the body, it was a very intense smell of gasoline, which means that he was either in the car longer than she says, or he actually did drink some gasoline, but the autopsy showed that there was no gasoline contents in his stomach. They did a full toxicology report. There were no drugs. There wasn't even alcohol in his system at the time that his body was found. Now, that doesn't include LSD, which they can't really do with a normal toxicology report, uh, or any hallucinogenics for that matter. So... You know, Bobby may be, you know, ODing on some LSD, which we'll talk about that in the theories. They wouldn't have been able to actually check for that. Another strange fact is that about four days after his body was found, Jim Reese and Dalton Powell, the guitarist and drummer for the band, were getting ready to head back to El Paso. Four armed men came looking for them. Uh, they weren't home at the time. Now, I've heard two accounts that the men came looking for Dalton Powell because he apparently had a uh, insurance policy taken out on him as well. But I also heard another account that they were came around looking for Bobby. So, you know, we'll get into the theories here in a little bit, but that's just a little fact that you got to keep in the back of your mind. So, given the facts of how his body was found, just the scene in general and the different accounts, it's hard to say what really happened, whether his car was pushed into the vacant lot, whether or not he, somebody had drove his car there. You know, we have his mom saying that the keys were in the ignition and his hands were on the keys. Uh, we also have another account and the other witnesses that stated, along with the L.A. County coroner's uh, state in the police report, which the police report is supposedly lost, okay, which is a pretty interesting fact all in itself. So, you can't really get any info on the police report whatsoever. But, we have his body slumped over. We have bruises on his left side. Now, petechial hemorrhages, I could see that happening. But, I would I would honestly think that you would have to be in that, in that enclosed area in quite a lot longer time than the time frame that's stated from uh, Lorraine Fuller. Whether or not it really was a few moments, I don't know. That was just what she was saying. Uh, it's hard telling, but as a mother whose son is missing, I would assume that she was telling the truth and pretty frantic at, at that point in time. So we get to move on now to some of the theories on what might have happened. I know the death scene might sound a little bit confusing. That's pretty much all the information in a nutshell. Sorry, it was uh, it was confusing for me too reading it. Trust me. So we start getting to some theories. Okay, I'm going to go by least plausible to the more suitable one that I think might might be true, and this is just my opinion. All right, there are a lot of theories on this, okay? The guitar player Jim Reese, his theory is actually that uh, Charles Manson actually committed this murder. That is just the biggest load of crap I've ever heard, just because of the fact that that Manson was actually still in prison in 66 with a year left on a federal sentence. 
So there's absolutely no way he could have done it, let alone he did not form his quote-unquote Manson family uh, anywhere around 66. You know, he, like I said, he was still in prison. He was getting released early, don't get me wrong, but he was still in prison with a year left on a federal sentence. So that is totally off the books. Now, another theory that I came across pretty late in the research, this one's actually pretty interesting. Bobby Fuller actually had an affair with a 15-year-old girl before he left El Paso and actually fathered an illegitimate son with her. I tried looking everywhere I could for information on this, and I only found it on one website. On the night that Bobby Fuller was killed, she was actually giving birth to another child that she had had with somebody else. Now, years later... Her father, on his deathbed, actually admitted to her that he had traveled to Los Angeles and him and a couple other guys were the ones that uh, killed Bobby Fuller. Now, she ended up changing her story years later, but I can't find any information on an illegitimate son. I can't find any information on her. So that was just something that I read just kind of off the books. Another really interesting theory that I heard. Uh, it actually does have a little bit of leg to it, but I totally am throwing this in one out the window because of the family factor. There's actually a theory that Randy Fuller and Jim Reese were the ones who committed the crime. Now, Jim Reese was obviously at his apartment with three other people before the body was found. Now, whether or not those two were involved or those three people were involved, I don't know. I didn't read any accounts on that, any theories on that. Um, they say that Randy and Jim were pretty upset over the fact that Bobby was deciding to go solo. They were going to be, be losing money and possible fame over it. And they, they say that this has legs because as soon as Bobby died, like within... Probably two or three weeks, Randy changed the name of the band to the Randy Fuller Four and took over lead singing, lead singing duties. Uh, the problem with this is Jim Reese had been drafted to Vietnam and had to report to duty in two weeks. So there's no real reason for him to want to kill Bobby over this. The fact that Randy and Bobby are brothers play a huge role for me, uh, whether it's fame or money. There are very, very few people on this earth that'll kill their own family because of music money, okay? That's just not plausible in my book. I can understand, yeah, he still wanted to keep going with his music, and that's fine. He played in a few other bands after Bobby's death. Let's go to the next theory. Frank Sinatra's daughter, Nancy Sinatra, was in the L.A. scene at the time, and her and Bobby were actually really close. Uh, she used to hang out at the PJ's nightclub, and Bobby and the Bobby Fuller Four, uh, they actually did a movie with Nancy Sinatra. Uh, I can't remember what year it was. It was either 64 or 65. During this movie, supposedly, Bobby had slipped Nancy uh, some LSD, and she had a bad trip. You know, we flash forward to... You know, when they're hanging out at PJ's, they're, Bobby Fuller 4 is playing there quite a bit. Nancy's always on the scene. There are rumors that they were involved, okay? Now, Frank Sinatra, uh, whose son was actually kidnapped in 1963, was rumored to have a lot of people watching over Nancy with, you know, I, it's totally understandable why you would want to have somebody watching over, you know, your daughter after your son's kidnapped three years earlier. And the, I guess those people are saying that, hey, man, these two are getting close. You know, he's involved in the LSD scene. You might want to put somebody in check. So they say that they went to rough him up and actually took it a little bit too far because Bobby was somewhat defiant. Like if somebody's going to walk up to him and say, hey, man, you can't date this chick. They said he would have definitely fought back. He was not a uh, not a passive person. So if somebody's trying to rough him up, they say he is going to fight back, which would explain the broken finger, uh, the dried blood around his mouth and on his shirt, which we you know it could have been caused by the gasoline fumes. We're not sure, and the bruising on the side of his body, which 
I personally don't believe was patechial uh, hemorrhages. I, I honestly believe that they were bruises. I don't think he was in that car long enough to get the hemorrhages. So there's another theory uh, that, that Frank Sinatra was probably not, you know, directly but not directly involved in, in the murder. Another really interesting theory is that when he gets the call at about 1 a.m., leaves in his lounging clothes, uh, it was to go to an LSD party. Now, I have two separate accounts on this as well. Uh, Randy Fuller actually says that the LSD party was canceled. It kind of fell through. Now, another account that I have from an eyewitness says that Bobby was there, and when he left, he was just fine, he was in good spirits, and he was still very much alive. Now, the part of this theory is that Bobby goes, takes too much LSD, has a bad trip, and either falls or has an accident of some sort to where he ends up dying. Now, it's it's not totally implausible that this could happen but that what they're saying is is that when he was when he has this accident everybody at the party gets scared because they're going to get busted for all these drugs so they you know make it look like a suicide like he was going to kill himself uh drive his car back to the lot i don't believe this for a second just because of the fact that lsd was still legal until october 6 1966 so why would they fear uh, getting in trouble for something that's not technically illegal. Um, I could see them being scared of being blamed for the accident or something of that sort. They also say that, you know, maybe he ha- he had a bad trip and wanted to drink or huff a bunch of gasoline. I don't really believe that theory either. It's, it's far-fetched, but it's not really far-fetched. I mean, it's quite believable. Um, but I really personally don't believe this one. Uh, now... We get to go into the huge, confusing mob theory, okay? So, Bob Keane is losing money on Bobby Fuller because he's trying his hardest to push all these, all these albums, all these records. He's borrowing pe- borrowing money from people that maybe he shouldn't. Uh, and like I said, supposedly there's an insurance policy of 800000 to a $1 million taken out on Bobby Fuller. Uh, at this time, uh, he's losing a lot of money because they're they're over prom- over promoting just the hell out of this music. You know, they're trying to trying to make some money. Uh, Delphi was not in the best financial state at that time, nor was Mustang Records. Bronco Records actually wasn't doing too bad. That was their R and B label. Um, so it's there's a theory out there that Bob Keen borrowed money. Uh, earlier on from a guy named Morris Levy, who was the owner of Roulette Records. Now, Morris Levy is a very shady character. He was actually born and raised in Brooklyn and has direct ties to the Genovese crime family at this time. Now, he's eventually convicted of, you know, extortion and I think it was 81. Um, he actually passed away before he did any prison time. They They say that the insurance policy was probably taken out by him and Bobby Fuller was murdered by Morris Levy's guys to try to recoup the money that Bob Keene actually owed them. Another part of this theory is that the PJ's guys who were Eddie Nash and Dominic Lucci, apparently Dominic was a pretty jealous guy. I don't know why a jealous guy would have his girlfriend doing part-time prostitution. That makes no sense to me. This is just one of the theories. They say that they were losing money. They were silent partners with Bob Keen, and they were losing money, and it was said that they actually took the insurance policy out on him because they knew he was planning on going solo because he was unhappy with the record label and the way his music was being overproduced and the direction that the band was heading so they actually lost a lot of money if the if the san francisco show never happened they actually had to pay out for lost revenue uh, to the club owner so in order to recoup some of this money and the fact that they were going to lose a lot of money 
with him going solo, you know, they had him taken out. This is my favorite theory, just because of the fact that three months after Bobby Fuller's autopsy was completed, the coroner's office changed his death certificate to accidental. Now, the reason that this was changed was because when you commit suicide, your insurance policies do not pay out. Interestingly enough, three months after he died, the official cause of death was accidental inhalation of gasoline, or accidental asphyxiation is what they said. And at that point, the insurance policy was actually paid out. Now, who it was paid out to, we don't know. I tried searching over and over to see who who had the insurance policy, and I could find absolutely nothing. That is my favorite theory on what happened. Given all these theories, you know, we got the full death scene on what happened. And, you know, like I explained, we have a lot of conflicting reports, and there's a lot of theories out there. Um, my personal favorite is, and I hate saying favorite because we are talking about a deceased uh, rock and roller here, but my favorite theory is that these two guys at PJs had something to do with it. The The one part that kind of throws me off too is, is Lloyd Essinger uh, claimed that he had been drinking with Bobby until right around 3 a.m. Everybody who knew Bobby, everybody who... Who knew him ever? Bobby was not a big drinker. He would have two or three beers and be done, okay? So it begs the question, if Bobby, who was an extremely meticulous dresser, okay, he very, very much cared about his appearance. I mean, it makes sense that he would leave his apartment in his pajamas and bathrobe if he was just going down to hang out with Lloyd Essinger uh, to drink a couple beers. But by this time, he had already had a couple so why would he drink a couple more? Now, at the same time, if I'm getting a phone call at 1 o'clock in the morning and I'm going to abruptly leave, it's not going to be a dude on the other end of that phone. I can guarantee you that. You know, I think I think Melody played a role in it. I think she called him and actually lured him into something. Uh, what she lured him into, I'm not sure. But there's not too many things that'll make a guy get up who's chilling out at home, bathroom pajamas, and straight up get a phone call and walk out the door. Um, unless somebody needed help, somebody needed something, it's really hard saying what that phone call was, who it was, and why he actually left. I don't believe Lloyd Essinger for a second, and another fun fact about Lloyd Essinger is he sits here stated all that stuff. The LAPD never even bothered to interview this guy or question him whatsoever. Uh, he might have had connections too. It's hard telling. Um, but with all this knowledge I just dropped on you, I hope everybody is confused as I am. It's just one thing after another. There's there's so many theories of what could have happened and what might have happened. But at the end of the day, I do not believe for a second that Bobby Fuller committed suicide. He has absolutely no reason. He had everything to live for. This guy had a top ten hit on the radio. And four months later, he's dead at the age of 23, okay? He was just getting into it. Now, granted, the music scene was changing. His style of music was going to die out sooner than later. But, but he was a talented enough musician, and he was an intelligent enough guy, and he actually loved producing his own stuff enough. I'm pretty sure he would have adapted to it and been just fine. So, in retrospect... You know, I just don't know. I was, I was hoping to try to solve something with this case, and it just begged more questions than answers. I really, I don't know, but if you guys have any theories on what might have happened or have actually looked into this case at all or have any information that, that I, you know, didn't state, uh, there was a lot of information that, you know, I probably forgot. I try to work this podcast on memory. I don't do a script, so there are times I forget stuff. But, you know, any information, comments, suggestions, uh, you guys can reach me at MysteriousCircumstances99 at gmail.com. Again, that's MysteriousCircumstances99 at gmail.com. Love to hear from you. Till our next episode. See you guys then.
The great visionary leader of India, Mahatma Gandhi said, it is health that is real wealth and not pieces of gold and silver. Listen to the Healthy Grocer radio show on your favorite podcast platform. We know that health is our greatest wealth and we will be discussing all aspects of natural healing. Explore everything from supplements, superfoods, and healthy lifestyle choices to help conquer stress and boost productivity. Top industry experts and natural health professionals join us for a deep dive into our healing journey. You can find the Healthy Grocer Radio Show on demand every day wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. And remember, health is your greatest wealth.